Hello, everyone. My name is Justin Blaylock, and this is my presentation on the uptake of per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS, in cannabis sativa. So first, we're just going to start with a general overview of what PFAS is. They are man-made aliphatic hydrocarbons, where either some or all the hydrogens have been replaced with fluorines. They were first created in 1946 by DuPont, and today there's around four to 5,000 different PFAS derivatives that exist. They're found in many everyday products, such as textiles or carpeting, found in state cookware, cosmetics, fast food packaging, among other things. And today they're defined as a persistent organic pollutant by the EPA. And here you can see some various classes and structures of different PFAS. And notice how the structures are very similar to that of lipids or fats, and that they have a polar head group and a straight chain non-polar tail. And this gives them a lot of versatility in use, which is one reason why they've been used so extensively since 1946. Another reason they've been used so extensively is their high thermal, biological, and chemical inertness. Um, this is largely due to the um, high number of carbon fluorine bonds that are present in these molecules. You can see over here the ionization potential, electron affinity, and electronegativity of fluorine is higher than that of fluorine, and this lends itself to stronger bonds to carbon. And because of this, they remain unchanged in the presence of many acids or bases, oxidants or, duct or reductants, and even UV irradiation. They're also resistant to temperatures up to 900 degrees Celsius, which for the discussion of cannabis is very important because that's the average burning temperature of the cigarette. And because they've been used so extensively since their inception in 1946, they're ubiquitous in the environment today, and they're considered forever chemicals because they don't break down. You can see most of it stems from industry, where it makes its way into consumer products and the environment, and eventually to us. Um, and it's, con it's estimated that over 90% of Americans contain traceable levels of PFAS in their blood serum. And in the environment, they're known to cause oxidative stress and metabolic imbalances in plants. They're also known to cause many adverse health outcomes in humans. They tend to bind to human serum albumin, and they bioaccumulate in the liver and kidneys, where they can cause a plethora of issues. Uh, on the right, you can see a figure that shows uh, various adverse health outcomes. The ones in bold are, have a strong correlation to PFAS exposure, and the ones that aren't in bold are suspected to be the cause of PFAS exposure, but aren't quite as certain. And the main route of exposure to PFAS is ingestion, but inhalation and absorption are also possible. And because this um, contamination is so pervasive, because they don't break down in the environment, and because they're known to cause adverse health outcomes, the main goal of this research was to examine PFAS uptake in plants and how that applies to cannabis. Also to call to attention the likely um, PFAS contamination of various cannabis products if it is making its way into cannabis. So this is a literature-based review. It was broke, my literature search was broken down into five different categories and peer review publications were taken from online journal databases such as ACS Publications, um, SciFinder, or Google Scholar. And you can see on the right in this table some various search words or phrases that were used to find only pertinent publications and some exclusionary criteria that were um, enacted were your publication and the quality of methods implemented for growing various vegetables in these um, contaminated PFAS environments. So what was probably the most surprising thing that was found was that diet actually is the most common route of exposure to PFAS. There has been a lot of past research done and focused on drinking water, but it turns out that diet is actually the most common route of exposure that's likely due from agriculture uptake through the soil, groundwater, or irrigation water. And for cannabis, that, um, for PFAS rather, that plant uptake is both apoplastic and symplastic, which is to say both through the cell wall and also through the cytoplasm. Now, short chain PFAS tend to have an easier time being taken up into the plant than their longer chain counterparts, and that's most likely due to the Casparian strip. And what this is, is a band of cell wall material that is chemically different from the rest of the cell wall. And its job is to inhibit the uptake of various toxins or pollutants from the environment. And just because of the sheer size of the long chain PFAS, it is um, hypothesized that, that, that the Casparian strip is very effective at preventing those long chain PFAS from being taken up into the plant. And the literature has established a direct correlation between PFAS concentration in soil or groundwater and the resultant concentration in plant biomass. And this is better described by these two graphs here. The one on the right is log scale root concentration factor of various PFAS. And root concentration factor is defined as the ratio of soil to root concentration. And you can see the upward trend with increasing chain length with PFBA having four carbons, 
PFOA having eight carbons and going up from there. And what this shows is that long chain PFAS tend to absorb or adsorb to the roots um, much more than the short chain PFAS, which are more mobile in the environment. And the right graph here shows average translocation factor of various PFAS. And translocation factor is defined as the ratio of shoot to root concentration. And so what this shows is that short chain PFAS over here are much more likely to be translocated throughout the plant than their longer chain counterparts, which are more likely to stay in the roots. And that's even further supported by these graphs here, which show the percent distribution of PFAS into different plant tissues of four garden vegetables. And you can see the two left bars in each graph are short chain PFAS. And you can see a larger percentage of total PFAS is translocated to the leaves, heads, or fruits of these various plants. Whereas the longer chain PFAS on the two white bars of each graph tend to accumulate and stay in the roots of the plant. Um, that chain length is actually the most important thing when considering plant partitioning of PFAS followed by pH and soil organic matter. So what are the implications of this? Well, it, um, it shows that long chain PFAS are much more persistent in the environment and they do not move around as much, but the silver lining is they're much harder to uptake. Whereas short chain PFAS are much easier to uptake into plants, but the silver lining there is that they're more mobile. So they're not around for as long, except when grown indoors, which a lot of cannabis is. And that's because in the environment throughout the growing season, short chain PFAS is, has the ability to be mobile and leach out elsewhere away from the plants. Whereas when you're growing indoors, you're growing in a pot and that, that has nowhere to go. And so the short chain PFAS do accumulate in those pots over the growing season. And so they're more bioavailable to the plant that way. And cannabis might be at a larger risk of PFAS contamination than household grown vegetables because it has a very aggressive root system. Um, cannabis sativa has been used to hyper, it is a hyper accumulator, and it has been used for phytoremediation of heavy metals in heavy metals contaminated areas because of that aggressive root system. It uptakes nutrients and heavy metals and possibly PFAS very aggressively. And so going forward, there's some areas of research that are, um, need more attention. PFAS soil chemistry and behavior is one of them to better understand how it's moving within the environment. Plant specific uptake mechanisms, especially when it comes to cannabis sativa is something that needs to be more researched to understand what the plant is doing with this PFAS when it uptakes it. Atmospheric deposition is a possible um, route of exposure to PFAS. There are some, there's some research coming out of China that shows agricultural grows that are near floral chemical plants are finding larger concentrations of PFAS in the plants than they are in the soil, which stands to reason that the nearby floral chemical plant might be contaminating these uh, crops through atmospheric deposition. And finally, hexafluoro propylene oxide dimer acid, which is called Gen X, um, is a general PFAS replacement for the now banned PFOA and PFOS. Yet there's research that suggests it might be just as toxic as its predecessors. And so more research is needed on Gen X to fully understand it. We know, and it's been established that PFAS is a persistent organic pollutant. It is very pervasive in the environment. It's not really broken down in the environment or in us. It's taken up into plants and it's known to cause adverse health outcomes. So as the cannabis market continues to grow in the United States at the rate that it is, there is much more investigation that needs to be done to understand if PFAS is a potential contaminant and a threat to the cannabis industry. Thank you very much for listening.